Well, good morning and welcome to your pre-recorded service for Sunday the 20th of September. I hope you've had a good week this week. I hope you've felt the Lord with you and you've known his blessing uh, throughout. Let me focus our hearts here this morning by reading for us from Psalm 46. This is the word of the Lord. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Amen. Folks, let's pray together for a moment. Father, we thank you for another Sunday, another day to to worship you, another chance to kind of gather wherever we are, whether we're in church or whether we're at home, we come to give you praise. And that's especially in light of the fact that we've been so restricted over the last five or six months. It's lovely to be able to be back in church It's lovely to maybe see people uh, in person again. But we also remember those who are not able to be out at church yet, Lord. Bring comfort, bring peace to them. And may you remind them of how much we miss having them in our midst. Lord, we thank you that you've watched over our lives in recent times. We thank you for calming our nerves and, and putting our minds at ease various stages we thank you that you've brought peace when all seemed lost and we thank you that we've never truly been alone since you're always with us may you speak to us today and remind us of how amazing and glorious you are forgive our sin forgive our failures from this past week turn our hearts to a posture of repentance lord And may we lean in on the grace and mercy that you so freely give. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Boys and girls, uh, I want to carry on sharing the story with you that we've been looking at over the last couple of weeks. And you'll remember that last week God told Saul that he was no longer going to be king over the Israelites. Saul had disobeyed God and showed that he was not the right man for the job. Well, this week God sent Samuel to find the right man for the job and make him king. So Samuel follows God's instructions. He goes to Bethlehem and he looks for a man there called Jesse. So God tells Samuel that one of Jesse's sons is the one who is to be king. So Samuel goes and he looks all around the town and he he finds this man, Jesse. And he tells Jesse, God has sent me here to find you because he has chosen one of your sons to be the new king over Israel. One of your sons is the right man for the job. Now, of course, Jesse. Well, Jesse's delighted at this. One of his sons is going to be king. How awesome, how wonderful. So he runs off and he gets his sons and he brings them out one at a time before Samuel. And he starts with Eliab, his oldest son. And Samuel looks at him and he thinks, this is it. Surely this is the king. He's tall. He's strong. He looks like he would be a good king. He looks like he could lead people. But God says to Samuel, no, this is not my king. You know, boys and girls, we often judge people by appearances, don't we? We make judgments about people just by looking at them. So we maybe see someone in school or someone in our street where we live and we make a decision about them before we even get to know them. We think, I don't like him. He dresses a bit funny. Or I don't like her. She has strange hair. And Samuel, you see, well, he was guilty of that very thing here. He was judging Jesse's sons by appearance alone. He saw Eliab. And he saw how big and strong he was and he thought that's the right man to be king. But you know what God said to Samuel? He said something really important. He said, do not consider his height or his appearance. People look at the outward appearances, but God looks at the heart. 
You see, what really matters is what's inside our hearts, our character. See, God doesn't want someone who looks like a king. God wants someone who is a king on the inside, someone with the right heart, the right character to be king. So Jesse, he carries on. It's not Eliab. He brings out his next son and his next son. And one by one, the Lord says, no, seven sons come out. None of them are right for the job. And Samuel says, well, oh, jeepers, is, is this it? You know, God sent me here and he said one of your sons is going to be, do you have any more sons? And Jesse says, well, actually, there's one more. There's one more, my youngest son, David. But he's away out in the hills. He's looking after the sheep. He does that kind of stuff. You see, Jesse had not even thought about David He'd pretty much forgotten about him. He was thinking, oh, it won't be David. It couldn't be. He's the youngest and the smallest. He's only a shepherd. He's not a big, strong warrior like my other sons. But Samuel said, go out, get David and bring him back. And so they waited and, and eventually David came back in and the Lord said to Samuel, that's my king. He is the right man for the job. You see, folks, God doesn't judge by outward appearance. He looks at the heart. That's what matters to him. Sometimes we might think that we're not big enough or old enough or strong enough to serve God. But actually, the only thing that matters to God is our hearts. Let's pray for a moment. Father, we thank you so much uh, that you only judge by the heart. We thank you that it doesn't matter how we look, how tall we are, how strong we are. What matters is on the inside. And when it comes to our salvation, the same thing applies. It doesn't matter what we do on the outside. What matters is what we believe in our hearts. Help us to put our faith in Jesus, for we pray it in his name. Amen. Well, folks, this morning in our prayers for others, we're using the prayer points that are circulated from PCI uh, each week. So let's draw close to God now as we pray to him. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this morning for our government, men and women who you have charged with the responsibility of leading us through this difficult period of this pandemic. We ask that you would continue to give wisdom to our leaders so they can exercise finely balanced judgment and make difficult decisions. We also pray for unity within the government in Westminster, especially as Brexit becomes one of the main focuses again. Lord, we pray that your will be done in our nation and that you would equip our leaders to bring us through Brexit in the best possible way so that people do not have to lose jobs or income or housing and so on. Father, looking further afield, we also thank you this morning for PCI's global mission workers and partners all around the world. And we ask that you would continue to bless their work and encourage them in life and witness as they minister in a multitude of settings and circumstances. We pray for grace, for patience, for creativity, resilience, wisdom and safety for all these missionaries as they serve you far away from their homes and far from their loved ones. Give them the joy, Lord, of seeing your kingdom grow as a result of their labour. Lord, we also want to give you thanks for the staff in care homes that are run by PCI around our country. This morning, we ask that you would continue to keep them safe as they serve the needs of residents under such difficult circumstances. And we pray too for these residents and their families, asking that they would know your peace and reassuring love in such times of disruption. Finally, Lord, we pray that as autumn soon gives way to the onset of winter that you would shelter us from a second spike in the coronavirus protect us lord we pray for wise restraint and the observation of necessary restrictions across society enabling attempts to avoid spreading the virus as more time is spent indoors and there is greater risk of the spread of infection during winter months Father, we bring all these prayers before your throne of grace. And as ever, we ask them in the strong and mighty name of Jesus. 
Amen. Well, folks, we turn now to God's word. Last week we heard how Saul fell at the first hurdle as king. He chose to take matters into his own hands. He neglected the commands of the Lord. So God determined that Saul was not the right man for the job. And so we pick up the story in chapter 16. Samuel then goes to identify the Lord's chosen man. So we start reading at verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul <clears throat> since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You're to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said when he arrived at Bethlehem. The elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health, had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. Amen. This is the word of the Lord and thanks be to God. Let's pray for a moment together. Father, we need your help to navigate these verses. Guide us by your Holy Spirit, we pray. Speak right into our hearts, Lord, and reveal your awesome power and perfect plan to us. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, folks, we know the story, don't we? You've maybe heard this a few times before. And yet I wonder, is there more going on here than we recognise? Let's have a closer look at this passage together and see what the Lord has to say to us this morning. So in verse 1, the Lord says to Samuel, How long are you going to mourn for Saul since I've rejected him as king? See, there was a connection between Samuel and Saul. Samuel had known Saul since he was a young uh, lad and clearly he had grown fond of him. Clearly he had a friendship with him. But remember, Samuel was the one who passed on God's message of judgment to Saul that his kingdom would not endure. And from that moment on, their friendship was over. In fact, we're told in chapter 15, verse 35, that Samuel never saw Saul again until the day he died. So Samuel suffered deeply over their severed relationship. I wonder, is there a, a, a lesson in that for us, folks? Sometimes God's plans can be hard to take. That's lesson number one. Sometimes God's plans can be hard to take. They can involve sacrifice. There can be tears and there can be mourning. And maybe you, some of you right now are in the middle of those kind of emotions. Maybe some of us are hurting because we're asking that big question, why God? Why are you doing this? And maybe some of us are seeing very little joy and only seeing hurt and strain. Folks, in these moments, we must try to remember the bigger picture. 
we've got to try and recall the promises of God that he does in fact have perfect plans for our lives. Perfect. And though there may be difficulty, God is always working for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purposes. That's Romans 8. Let me tell you this, even Jesus himself went through these emotions. Remember the Garden of Gethsemane? He begged the Father, please take this cup from me. He knew what awaited him. He knew the agony and humiliation that he was about to go through. And even as he hung on the cross, he cried out, Why, God, why have you forsaken me? But Jesus wasn't crying out in ignorance. He knew the answer to his question. He knew his father turned away from him for a reason. And that was so that he didn't have to turn away from us. Folks, sometimes God's plans can be hard to take. Sometimes there is sadness and sacrifice. But God calls us to trust in him. Just like Abram was called to leave his home and his family and step out in faith, so we must step out in faith as well. So God tells Samuel to go to Bethlehem and find Jesse and anoint one of his sons. God has chosen his king. And he's basically telling Samuel to trust in his plans. But look at Samuel's response in verse 2. He says, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. Did we really expect Saul to take this lying down? There's no way he's giving up his kingship without a fight. Samuel gave him the judgment from the Lord, yes, but Saul was obviously not going to accept it. He's hardened his heart towards the Lord now. He's thinking, I was chosen by the people. I'm the rightful king. I'm not going to give this up without a fight. And so as a result, Samuel is afraid to follow the Lord's command. So what's the lesson for us? Well, sometimes God's plans are unpopular. That's lesson number two. Sometimes God's plans are unpopular. Maybe even sometimes they can be dangerous. They can involve significant risk. And again, maybe some of us are feeling that at the moment. Maybe some of us are aware of the ever-shifting culture around us that seems to suggest that the Bible is utter nonsense. It's outdated. It's old-fashioned. It's unfit for use in the 21st century. Maybe some of us are feeling pressured from people around us, pressured to deny Jesus, pressured to just say no to all that faith stuff. Maybe some of us feel afraid of the persecution that seems to be drawing ever nearer to our shores. There are already cases of Christians losing their jobs because of their belief. We've already seen court cases and lawsuits against Christians because of their biblical principles. Folks, in those moments, we've got to remain allegiant and loyal to God. He has never promised us an easy life. In fact, his word even tells us that anyone who wants to live a godly life will be persecuted. That's what 2 Timothy says. God's plans and commands are rarely going to be accepted by the masses. But we've got to remember the true freedom is not found by giving in to our societal demands or our inward sinful desires. Rather, freedom is found only in Christ. We need rescued from our sin and Jesus alone can rescue you. Folks, everything Jesus did was unpopular with certain people. Let's face it, he was persecuted from his birth through to his death. Even when he was a baby, Herod wanted to kill him. And in his ministry, the Pharisees were constantly trying to trap him and test him and twist his words. They watched him heal on the Sabbath. They watched him socialize with sinners. They listened to him liken himself to God and make claims about his divinity. And in the end, he was so unpopular that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they drummed up false charges and had him killed. Why should we ever be surprised that God's plans are sometimes unpopular? God calls us, though, to be loyal and to trust in him. Because even though he may prove unpopular, he is never wrong and he always acts for our good. So Samuel meets Jesse and asks to see his sons. 
The Lord obviously hasn't revealed the chosen one to Samuel yet. And there's a lesson he wants Samuel to learn from this. And in fact, a lesson we all need to learn. This is lesson number three. Mankind gets caught up in outward appearances, but God looks at the heart. And how true this is. Aren't we all guilty of this in our lives? Don't we all judge a book by its cover sometimes? Don't we all make assumptions about people based on where they're from or what they're wearing or what their job is? I remember chatting to a, a car salesman who worked for a very high-end car manufacturer and he told me that any time a customer came into the showroom, he was trained to look at their watch and look at their shoes and that would reveal perhaps how wealthy the person was. This is how the world operates. And Samuel fell foul of this immediately. He made the exact same mistake that the Israelites had made earlier. He takes one look at Jesse's son, Eliab, his height, his stature, his strength. And that was enough. He was ready to anoint him as king there and then. But God said no. God had chosen his king already. The, the, the people had picked Saul. Samuel was ready to pick Eliab. But neither of them were the one because God didn't want someone who looked like a king. He wanted someone with the heart of a king. He wanted David, a man after his own heart. How amazing then, how amazing that the one who was not even invited to be part of this thing was now the one who was being waited on as the principal guest. If I've said one phrase more than any other since I've arrived at High Street, it's possibly this, that God cares about the heart. And folks, this is brilliant news for us. I don't know if anyone has seen the new All or Nothing series on Amazon Prime. It's a documentary that gives behind the scenes footage at uh, Tottenham Hotspur's football club during the last 12 months or so here. And one of the things that really stood out to me was just how difficult it is for the manager, in this case Jose Mourinho, to pick his starting 11 players for a match because it meant he had to say no to all of the others. All the other squad members were told, no, you're not picked this week. Only the best 11 can play. So it's only the fittest, only the fastest, only the strongest, only the most skillful. Well, folks, praise the Lord that being a Christian is nothing like being part of a Premier League football team. It doesn't matter how big and strong we are. God wants all of us and loves all of us no matter what. And Jesus emphasised this so often in his ministry. He was continually going towards what we might call the unlovables. The people who had been rejected by society. The people who had illnesses. The people who had lowly jobs. The people who were hated. The people who were marginalised. The people who were impoverished. Why? Because God cares about the heart. And your position, our position, as children of God, has been won by Christ and is given as a gift to those who have Jesus in their hearts. It's not about ritual. It's not about how many times we come to church or how often we resist temptation. It's not about how well behaved we are. It's all about having Jesus in our hearts. Lastly, one final lesson to be learned. Number four from our story this morning. David arrives. He's chosen by the Lord. This is the right man for the job. So Samuel anoints him as king. Now we'll pause for a moment. Let's not underestimate this. What a huge moment this is for David. Put yourselves in his shoes. Saul is still the king and you're a young man, still not even an adult. And this guy claiming to be God's prophet comes along and says, God has chosen you to be king over Israel. You're going to take over from Saul and your kingdom will be established forever because you're a man after God's own heart. Wow, what a huge responsibility to be put on such young shoulders. But have a look at verse 13, the final verse that we read. It says this, from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. So what's the lesson? Number four, God equips those he calls. He never leaves us empty handed. And we shall see this in future weeks. But the Lord was with David throughout every step of his life. And folks, the same is true for us today. God is with us always. Yes, he's always near. Even in the pit, he is there. But even more than that, as we put our faith in Jesus, 
in his death and resurrection, as we look to him as our Lord and Saviour, Paul says in Ephesians 1 that we're given the gift of the Holy Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing our future in heaven with the Lord. This is the same spirit who raised Christ from the dead, the same spirit who empowered and guided the apostles in Acts, and he lives inside us, connecting us to Christ and empowering us and equipping us to live for God. God equips those who he calls. Folks, let's never rely on our own strength. Rather, let's lean on God's grace and on the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within. Amen. That's us for this morning, folks. I will be back on your screens uh, tomorrow. We have finished 2 Corinthians uh, and we'll be moving in our daily readings into 1 Timothy. So join us for that around kind of four o'clock in the afternoon or so. Uh, and until then or until next Sunday, we'll simply finish by sharing the grace. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen. Thank you.